Praise the Lord. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning at the 8th verse. For the last couple of weeks we've been ministering about Elijah. And just to kind of lay a foundation to go along with this, there are three type shadows we're using here. And one of those is when you see the word prophet, when you see a prophet come on the scene, it's talking about the living, speaking Word of God. We know from our, from, prior, from our prior teachings that there are two basic words for the word word in the Bible. One is logos, which is general information, but then the second word is rhema, which means the living, speaking Word of God. And so when you see a prophet come on the scene, we understand that that's the living, speaking, right now, Word of the Lord to you. And we also learned in one of our other lessons that when the living, speaking, right now word comes, it causes change to occur. We, when, when we studied it, we were looking at this last, last week, we looked at, for instance, we looked at the situation where, they, the, where the, the sons of the prophets had said unto Elijah, Behold, now the place where we are is too straight, it was too small, it was too confined. So it came to a place where they needed to move. And they responded to the word of God by obeying the word of God and moving and building a bigger house. And in the process of them building that bigger house, we also learned that when you lose things in God, the best thing you can do is to go back to where you lost it at so that God can resurrect it and give it back to you. Okay, so this week, looking at, three, at the three type shadows we're using, Elijah, the prophet, is a type shadow of the speaking, living, spoken, rainbow word of God. The servant, Gehazi, in this passage of Scripture, is going to be a type shadow of the Holy Spirit. And the Shulamite woman that we're going to talk about tonight is going to be a type shadow of the church, a type shadow of the Christian receiving the word of God. Okay? And what we're going to talk about is, is building a place for the word. Let me say that one more time again. Building a place for the Word. Verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter 4, verse, four, verse 8 says this, And it fell on a day that Elijah passed by the Shunem, where there was a great woman, <coughs> excuse me, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be that when he comes unto us, he shall turn in. And it fell in the day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and he lay there. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you anoint your word. And Father, most of all, we thank you, thank you that you watch over your word to perform it. Father, we ask you to bless this time, Father, and anoint the ears of those that are hearing this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's look at a couple of things here. What I want us to see is, first of all, the living, speaking word of God showed up. Elijah showed up on the scene, and he was met by a, the Shulamite woman who we're using as a type shadow of the church. And the Bible says that she constrained him. She didn't just receive him. She constrained him. Okay, that word constrained in the Hebrew, it means to seize. It means to conquer. It means to be consistent. It means to be courageous. It means to attach yourself to. It means to cleave. The same as when a husband and wife get married, the Bible says they cleave and they become one flesh. How many of y'all know that you need to become one flesh with the Word? Amen? The book of John says that the living Word of God, the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us and we behold, beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten Son of God. Okay? So when the Word comes forth, we need to receive it, and it needs to become a part of us. Right. We need to seize that word. We need to grab that word, and we need to let that word become a part of us. 
If somebody was to ask me who Jesus is, you know what I tell them? I tell them that Jesus is everything that Isaiah said he was. Yes. See, Isaiah prophesied about the Lord coming. So, Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Jesus is everything that Jeremiah said he is. Jesus is everything that Ezekiel said he is. Jesus is everything that all of the prophets said he was because when Jesus appeared on the scene, he became the living embodiment of the flesh of that word and he walked those words out. So we follow that same principle. And when the word of the Lord comes to us, we need to receive it, and we need to grab it, and we need to compel it to be a part of us. Okay? When salvation comes, it's not some passive thing. When you hear the word of salvation, you grab that and you hold on to it. And you obey what that word says. The, the woman here, she, when she saw the prophet come on the scene, the Bible says she was a notable woman. That means that she was prominent in the area where she lived. Everybody knew about her. And so when the prophet showed up, when the living word showed up, she literally grabbed him and said, you need to come to my house. That's correct. Okay, we need to say that. We need to say, word, come to me and be a part of me. Amen? Amen. So the woman constrained. The word passed by. Let me show you a scripture. Look in the book of in the book of Mark, chapter four, and we're going to be going probably into this into, into this scripture in the in the coming weeks. But look what it says in Mark chapter four, Mark the fourth chapter, Mark chapter four, and the Bible says, Mark chapter four, verse fourteen. It says, "The sower sows the word. Mm -hmm. The sower sows the word." In this passage of Scripture, who is the sower? The sower in this passage of Scripture is God. Do you realize that God goes out every day and He puts His Word out there? He puts His Word out there through people ministering on television. He puts His Word out there through people ministering on radio. He puts His Word out there through people preaching on street corners. He puts His Word out there by you going to your job, going to your occupation every day, and becoming a living epistle, living a Christian life in front of other people. His Word goes forth. Mm -hmm. And the Scripture says that some of the Word falls on the wayside. Those are people who hear the Word and don't want anything to do with it. Then the Scripture says that some of the people receive, that some of the, some of the Word falls in the thorns, and it falls in the thistles, and it gets choked. But eventually, some of that word falls on good ground, and it becomes it, it produces fruit 30, 60, and 100. I want to challenge you that you become, this, this Shulamite woman was good fruit. She was good ground. So when she received the word, amen, it began to bear forth in her life. And we'll see that in, in, in a later time. We'll see how the word produced fruit in her life in the, in, in the in, in the manifestation of a son that God blessed her with. Okay? So you see, when the word comes forth, and you constrain, and you seize that word, that word will produce in your life. That's what it is. The word is designed to produce fruit. It's designed to produce the, the intended result in your life. The Bible even says that God watches over his word to perform it. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Bible says that the word of faith is nigh thee even in your mouth and in your heart. The Bible says that his word brings life. The Bible says that his word brings joy. The Bible says that his word brings peace. See, it's about the word. And the Bible says that the living word became flesh and dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus. Amen? The word was passing by and she took the opportunity, folks, and she grabbed it. Amen? Amen. Okay? Look at, turn with me one more, one more scripture. The book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 24. Mark, chapter 7, verse 24. And I was going to try to be short tonight, but I just don't know if that's going to happen or not. The book of Mark, chapter 7, beginning at the 24th verse. Mark, chapter 7, beginning and verse 24. And the word of the Lord says this. 
And from thence he arose, and he went unto the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. How many of y'all know that when God places his anointing on you, you can't be hid? See, some of y'all trying to hide the calling in your life. Some of y'all trying to hide the presence of God in your life. The Bible says that you are a light set on a hill that cannot be hid. Amen. Jesus has wanted to get away and rest a little bit, and he wasn't able to. Because he tried to hide in this little house he was at, but yet even though he, because of who he was, because of the, because he was the word, because he was the word that became flesh, he couldn't be hid. And I'm here to tell you tonight that the day is coming that the word that's hid in you cannot be hid any longer. The prophetic word that came forth tonight said that. Said that the glory is going to become greater and greater and more prominent and more precious and more powerful in our lives. Amen? So, he couldn't be hid, verse 24. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek. She was a Seraphonician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Look what Jesus says. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dog. She called that woman a dog. Jesus called that woman a dog. Said, You can't receive this. You're a dog. This is meant for the children of Israel. But look what she says. She decided she was not going to be denied. How many people have, how many times have you quoted a promise, quoted a scripture, and only to have some religious, silly little church folk come to you, some religious person come to you and say, that's not for today. You're not worthy of that because of your past. That will never come to pass in your life. And that's what Jesus basically kind of told her here. Okay, but Jesus is using wisdom. Jesus says, woman, you're a dog. You can't have the children's bread. But the woman, wanting to constrain Jesus, wanting to seize, wanting to conquer, wanting to cleave to him and get the word, what did she say? She answered and said, yay, Lord. Didn't argue with me. She agreed. Yeah, Lord, I'm a dog. Yay, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And Jesus, and the Bible says in verse 29, And he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The devil is gone out of your daughter. See, she couldn't be turned away. Okay? She wasn't able to be denied. And we need to be like that. See, there's going to be times you're going to claim a promise. And it's not one of these days, you see right now, especially for young Christians, it's great. Okay? They can sit there and they can quote a promise and it's like an angel just pours it out on them. They receive it, boom, bam, it's done. But there's going to come a day in your life that God's going to cause you to walk out some stuff. He's going to cause you to walk through some things because he wants to mature you and cause that promise to become real in you. Okay? So when the problems come, whether the problem is somebody saying you can't have that promise, whether the problem is it's not manifesting the way that you think it should manifest, or whether it's a situation where it's a, God's bringing you through a process instead of through an instantaneous miracle, you need to cling to the Word. You need to cleave to the Word. You need to become one with that Word. Amen? Amen? She wasn't just content, the Shunammite woman, back to 1 Kings chapter, 2 Kings chapter 4. She wasn't just content with having that word pass by. She wasn't just happy about content with having church on Sunday or church on Saturday or church on Wednesday and then the other five days of the week just kind of, oh, I hope I get by and I hope I make it and I hope I can, I can get, oh, Lord, I'm just a pilgrim passing through this barren land. No, that's not the way she wanted to be. You see, the real believers don't live from Sunday to Sunday or live from Sunday to Wednesday to Sunday. The real believers are in this word every day. They'll hear a word on Sunday 
and they're dissecting that word through the week. They're studying that word out through the week. They're finding out what that word really means. They're getting in there. They're listening to that CD. They're listening to that DVD. They're listening to that radio broadcast again. They're reading that scripture every day, and they're making it a part of their lives. So we see here the woman, when she realizes that there's a prophet among them, that the living word of God comes, it wasn't just enough for her to hear the word once a day or hear the word once a week, I'm sorry. But she said, you know what? She went to her husband and says, hey, I, be, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. This is a speaking, living word coming to me. So I want to do something. She went to her husband and she says, let's build a little chamber. Let's build a little closet. Let's build a little room. And we're going to put some items in that room. We're going to put four things in that room once we build it. And we're going to make it to where that whenever the word, the prophet, whenever the word comes by, it has a place to rest. See, she didn't take the word of God lightly. She wasn't counting on the Word of God showing up every day. You know, Abraham went 40 years between times God spoke to him. Okay? So she wasn't counting on God's Word showing up every day, but she wanted to be prepared when the Word showed up. Look what she does. Look what she does. She prepares a place. That word prepare <coughs> means to shape. It means to form. How many of y'all have ever built a house? How many of y'all have ever built a room? How many of y'all have ever built something? You just don't go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a bunch of two-by-fours and some plywood and some shingles and just throw something up. No, you sit down if you want to do it right, and you draw it out. You count the cost of how many nails you're going to need, how many two-by-fours you're going to need, how much wood you're going to need, if you're going to need screws, if you're going to need shingles, Whatever you're going to need, you sit there and you see the room she built, it wasn't a haphazard thing. She didn't just go and find some stones and lean them up against the wall. She planned it out. It wasn't something that was just haphazard. She actually took time. She thought about it. She planned it out. It was deliberate. It had a purpose. And that purpose was strictly to save and, 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 and protect and contain, for lack of a better term, the prophet, the man of God. Or in this case, as we're talking about in, by analogy, the living word of God. Okay? Now, the chamber was built on the wall. That's important. Because the wall is the protection of the city. The wall is the protection of your life. The wall is, is what surrounds you and keeps you protected. So what happens is she put the chamber on the wall of the city. See, the prophet needs to be on the wall. Any place in Scripture where you see the prophet looking out, he's always on the wall. What did Habakkuk say? He said, I will stand upon my watchtower. The watchtower was on the wall. And I will be careful to see what the Lord will speak to me. Okay? So we that are people of the word need to be on the wall. We need to be in a place where we can guard the people around us. We need to be in a place where we can see the enemy coming so that when he comes, we can fight him and we can devise a plan to defeat the plan of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Okay. So she builds it on the wall. And she puts four items in it. She puts in a bed. A table, a stool, and a candlestick. Four things. She puts in four things. Very quickly, what are those four things for? Each one of those four things has a purpose, and it has a separate purpose. Okay? And by analogy, these are four things that we need to include in our daily devotion and in our prayer life. These are four things that we need to consider when we're praying, when we're studying the Word, and when we're meditating on the Scripture. Okay, the first thing that was there 
was that there was a bed. They put a, she put a bed in there. That bed tells us that there is a rest for the people of God. I believe it's the book of Hebrews that tells us that. There remaineth yet a rest for God's people. You ever notice Jesus? Jesus never got in a hurry. You know why Jesus never got in a hurry? Because Jesus even said it. He said, the works that I do, I see my Father do. So Jesus didn't have an agenda. Jesus wasn't concerned about what was going on. Because he wasn't going to do anything until he saw his daddy do it. The Bible says that Jesus said the words that I speak. I don't speak of, not, of, not of myself, but it's the Father within me. So you see, Jesus wasn't even concerned about what he was going to speak about. Because he was going to wait until the Father told him what to say. And you know, we've got that promise. The Bible says that when they deliver you up before the council... When they deliver you up before me, men, the scripture says. When they deliver you up to, for trials and tribulation. The Bible says don't take any thought about what you're going to say. Because in that self same hour, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. I can remember when I was a young preacher. When I was young in the Lord. When I was young in ministry. The pastor, the pastor I sat under, they brought us up with it. Everybody would say that the expression is they brought us up hard. Okay? But you were subject, if everybody knew you were a minister, you were subject, especially at, 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 at the church we were attending at the time, that you could walk in on a Sunday morning and you could be sitting down and you'd be sitting on the platform. And that's where the particular background I came from, that's where all the preachers sat. They sat on the platform in front of all the people. And the pastor would turn around. And he would say something along the lines, and after the soloist, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Brother Jason Mitchell. He will be bringing the Sunday morning message. No prior phone call, no email, no text, no nothing. You found out when you got there, unless you were a praying man and God let you know ahead of time. Amen? So you see, you had to be, the Bible always... But the old expression was, you always have one in the box. Well, I got some news for you. The Holy Spirit has His Word in the box for you. He's going to give you what to say when you need to say it. Okay? And that's why you need to be slow to speak and quick to hear. Quick to hear what? Quick to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Okay? So we see here, there is a rest for the people of God. That bed symbolizes a rest. Okay? Now that word rest in the Hebrew... It means to repose. You know what it means? It means to relax. It means to take your ease. It means to be restored. It means to have rest and to be refreshed. So you see, the Word of God, first of all, is to calm you down. How can you tell the difference between the devil, the devil talking to you and God talking to you? One of the big things is, is that the devil will get in a hurry. And he will cause you to hurry. And he will cause you to rush. Now I'm not saying that if the, if the, if the, if the roof is caving in, you don't need to run out the building. Okay? But when you get that anxious feeling, when you get that anxious and you get that like something is pushing you, prodding you, make sure that what you're hearing is lining up with Scripture. Because the Bible says that God gives you rest, and he moves you in peace, and he moves you calmly. He doesn't get in a hurry. You never see Jesus getting rushed, and you never see Jesus getting in a hurry. Amen? Amen. So that word means to rest. It means to repose. It means to relax. It means to be refreshed. Now, let me say this. Rest is not the absence of conflict. It's not the absence of turmoil. It's not the absence of a battle. It means that you know that in His presence, all is well. Amen? So you see, there's a difference. It doesn't mean you're not going to have conflict. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a battle. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have, have to fight. 
But because we have his word, going back to that word again, and we know that he watches over his word to perform it, and we know that we have hidden his word in our heart, and we know that his word is becoming flesh in us, we know that we can rest in him. Okay? All right. Y'all need to go and study that word rest. I'm, I've camped out on it too long. I'm not, not going to get finished if I don't move on. Okay. All right. We need to learn to, but the, the, this to say, we need to learn to apply his word to our lives and realize that this is the final authority for us. When you get time, read Matthew chapter 11, the verse 28 and 29. Okay? When Jesus is crossing the, red, crossing the sea and the storm comes up and the storms begin to fight and everything, and the Bible says that the disciples said, Lord, we're going to perish. And they're looking around for Jesus. Where is he? Asleep in the bottom of the boat on a pillow. Mm -hmm. Why is he asleep? Because before they got in the boat and before they started crossing the Sea of Galilee, he said, we're going over to the other side. He spoke what his father said. His father told him to go to the other side. He spoke it forth, and he went. And so when the storm came, when the enemy tried to stop him, he's asleep. His disciples didn't get the revelation. Get that revelation tonight. Amen? Okay, come on, we got to move on. A table. The next thing in the room was a table. What does a table do? A table symbolizes a place of provision. Look at Psalms 23 with me. The Bible says he prepares a table for me in the presence of who? My friends? In the presence of who? The people that love me? In the presence of who? The people who always pat me on the back? No. The Bible says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Can I just tell you something tonight? That if you've got the Word of God in your life, if you're studying the Word, and if you're walking in the Word, and you've made the Word a part of you, that even in the midst of, fi of fiery trials and struggles, God will provide for you. He places His, He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That table talks about provision. You see, what happens at a table? Well, look, you eat at a table, guys. That's what happens at a table. That's God's bountiful blessings of being upon, being placed, being placed in front of you. You see, God will display your blessings for the world. See, I was reading an article today in one of our in a, in a Christian magazine. I was reading an article today. There's some people all been out of shape about this pastor in North Carolina who just built a, a beautiful house. And they are all been out of shape about it. Well, you know what? Guess what? The Lord blessed him to be able to build that house. It's all right. Don't be judging another man's blessing. Okay? Don't be hating on somebody because the Lord blessed them. Amen? Okay? Because God will prepare a table and he's going to display your blessings in front of the, in, in front of for the whole world to see, you can't hide the blessings of God. That's not they're not designed to be hide. The Bible says that He's going to give the righteous wealth in order to make the sinner jealous. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that doesn't mean that if you're poor and you're broke and you don't have anything that you're at, you're any less godly than somebody who's a millionaire. That's not what that's saying. Okay, but anyway. The Bible says, that first of all, that table is a place of provision. We talked about it being a place where you eat. It's a place of feeding. Now, you need to understand when you're going, for the, going in front of God's Word, when you're going to read God's Word, that God is feeding you. He's blessing you. The Bible says, even Jesus used to use, he said, he said this when, when he fought the devil. When he confronted the devil on the Mount, what we call in the wilderness or the Mount of Temptation. Okay? He said, it is written. That man shall not live by bread alone. There was one other time when the Bible says his disciples said, Master, you need to eat. And he said, he said, guys, I have meat to eat you don't know of. And he said that my meat is to do the will of my Father. Okay, so we go and we receive the Word of God because we realize that we don't want to get over into an, into an area of just 
quoting scripture and quoting the word at a problem when we haven't really understood what that word says. Okay? You, you can mentally assent to what the word of God says, but the word of God, in order for it to be living and rhema and real, doesn't need to come from up here. It needs to come from down in the spirit man. It needs to be a living Rhema word that the Holy Spirit is speaking out of your spirit. And when you speak it, it comes forth in power. It comes forth in anointing. It comes forth in love. And signs and wonders follow that word. Amen. So you see, we feed on that word. It's food to us. We need to realize that we need that word more than we need natural food. Yes. Okay. The table is also a place of study. I love to get it drives my wife nuts. It drives Sister Marvin nuts. I will take out, we got this, we got a the Lord bless us with a nice dining room table. And there are times I'll just scatter all my books across that dining room table. I got a desk in my little office, okay? But I like to spread out, spread stuff out. In fact, I've always said this, you know what I want for a pulpit? One day and I'm gonna have it. I want a big drafting table. I do. I want a drafting table. It stands about yay high, and it kind of sits at an angle like that. And I can spread out my King James Version Bible here, my Amplified here. I can put my iPod there, my iPad over here, and I can kind of spread my stuff out. Okay? Well, that's what the, that, that, that's what the Word of God is. It's a place where we can spread out and study. That's the reason that table was there. So you see, we need to learn to study the Word. We need to learn to meditate on the Word. We need to learn to pray the Word. That word meditate, as an example, means to mutter. It means to rehearse. It means to talk it to yourself. It means to, to say it out loud to yourself. But I found another definition of that word meditate. It means to roar. There's sometimes you've got to shout that word at you. Amen? Okay. It's a place to study. But you know what else? It's also a place of preparation for war. Let me say that again. It's a place of preparation for war. I like old war movies. And I like when they go into the war room and they go to where they're, they're planning and they're strategizing. And they'll have this great big table. And they'll have little bitty army men and little bitty tanks. And little bitty guns and stuff like that. And that table's laid out, and they got the enemy over here, and they got the good guys over there, they got battlements over here, they got fortresses over there, and they're taking and then moving that stuff around, mimicking the movement of soldiers and the move, movement of resources. Okay? We need to realize that God places that God has called us to a place of war. The Bible says that we serve a God who teaches our fingers to make war. The Bible says that we are called into the army of the Lord. Amen? So it's a place of war. And when you're studying that word, when you're reading that word, and that word is becoming a part of you, then you are being prepared to go fight the enemy. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, he said what? He said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Let me tell you something. We've been taught for too long that the church is a fortress and we're kind of occupying and we're holding the devil back. That's not what that scripture says. It says that the gates of hell, hell is a fortress. The powers of darkness are a fortress. And the Bible says that we, the children of God, are pushing and knocking those gates down. We are the, on the offense. We are not on the defense. Yes. Defense doesn't win football games. We play football here, here in America. And this broadcast is going out all over the world. This teaching is going out everywhere. Okay? We play football here in America. And you got people moving up and down the field. Okay? Very seldom does the defense make a touchdown. It happens occasionally. But defense doesn't win football games. The quarterback, the halfback, the running backs, the wide receivers... They win football games because they go against the defense and they push the defense back until finally they get to the end zone. Amen? We need to start pushing against the devil and get to his end zone and win this battle so Jesus can come back and this is over with. Amen? Amen. Okay. That's enough about the table. The next thing that is there is a stool. Again, a stool is a place of study. But it also, that word stool 
is actually the Hebrew word for the word throne. The word throne. So you see, the thrones back in those days, we've seen some of the things like in different countries and stuff like that where they sit in a nice big throne and they get the big armrests and you kind of sit back and get the big thing over the back and maybe like the crest, over, the crest of your country over the back of it and everything. Well, the throne spoken of here actually had a covering over it to shield the queen or the king from the sun because we didn't want them to be hurt. We didn't want them to be uncomfortable. And they were actually able to lie, kind of half lie down in it. And it was carried by people, of course. Okay, So that throne talks about being covered. It carries the meaning of having covering. You know, here in America, there's a lot of talk today about covering. And you've got to have somebody covering you when you go out in ministry and stuff like that. And you've got to have covering. And, you know, you've got to be sheltered. You've got to have be protected. Now, there's not a thing wrong with covering and with accountability. You need to have that. You need to be accountable to someone. Someone needs to keep you in check in case you get off track. Amen? But the Bible tells me that, that His Word is my covering. His Word is my covering. If I stay in His Word, I'm going to be protected. If I stay in His Word, and one of those words is that in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. Okay? Because I'm a Word man. So if I'm a word man, then I'm going to do what the word says. Okay? So that word stool talks about covering. It talks about being having a posture of alertness. Okay? Remember the posture of alertness. Let me talk about that for a second. Okay? When, at the time of Passover, how were the Israelites told to eat Passover? They were told to eat it standing up. They were told to eat it clothed. And they were told to eat it with their sandals on their feet. Why is that? Because they were going to be delivered that very night out of Egypt. So God wanted them ready. Can I say this to you tonight? The word of God is making you ready. The Word of God is what prepares you for ministry. The Word of God is what prepares you to help other people. The Word of God is what prepares you to be able to deal with the trials and the situations that you come across in everyday life, whether it's in your family, whether it's with your body, or whether it's on your job, or whether it's with your crazy relatives. Okay, the Word of God is what makes you ready. And... This word, that word throne, it places you. Yes, it places you in a, in, with a covering, and it places you with protection, and it places you with comfort, but it also places you in a certain posture, a certain posture of alertness and ready to respond. If the king or the queen needed to get out of that throne, she was able to exit quickly. Okay? You ever watch the Secret Service people when they protect the President of the United States? Them some awesome people, okay? And the first thing that happens, I was just reading this a few days ago. I was, I was actually, I was watching it on, on television just a few days ago. When, some, when they tried to assassinate one of our presidents, President Ford, when the shot rang out, the Secret Service person threw him into the floorboard of the limousine. He fell on top of him, and then the chief of staff fell on top of the Secret Service person. And they sped out of the, they sped out of the danger zone, and it was some four or five blocks later that they realized that they were crushing the president. He wasn't able to breathe, so they had to get everybody untied out on, on, on top of him. Okay, well, I want you to know that the throne, the, the, the stool that God places you on, is the same way, so that you can exit quickly and get back in the fight quickly. Amen. So, we got a stool. And then the last thing, in my clothes, the last thing we see is a candlestick. 
What does a candlestick do, guys? What does a candlestick do? A candlestick brings light. Simple enough. A candlestick brings light. Okay? So, when we see the candlestick, a candlestick is a picture of revelation. The Bible says that God's word, the entrance of your word, bringeth light. Amen? The Bible says that his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. Okay? Because, because, because of the situation I'm in, I'm not able to move around a lot, but if you could see me, what I would show you would be that lamp that they use is the, is, is the, the lamp that they use was just enough to light the path directly in front of you. You weren't able to see two, three, or four steps ahead. You were only able to see one step in front of you, maybe two steps. So you see, as you took that step, then you were able to see the next step. And then you were able to see the next step. And then you were able to see the next step. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. Amen? And then the next thing, when you have revelation, you have what is called impartation. Now, what is impartation? Revelation is understanding. Revelation is understanding. When you ever read a scripture, and all of a sudden you've read that scripture 5, 10, 15, 20 times, and then one day you read that scripture again, and all of a sudden, wow, I understand what that means. So now you've got a revelation of that scripture, but then something else happens. Something else happens. What is that? All of a sudden, you begin to live that scripture. That, my brother, that, my sister, is impartation. That word has now not just become real to you, it's became a part of you. And you see, in the coming weeks, when we begin to look at, the, at what happens in the Shulamite woman's life, we're going to see that Elijah goes to her and says, what is it that you want? And she doesn't have, she says, I dwell among my own people. I don't want anything. And Gehazi, a type of the Holy Spirit, reveals that she doesn't have a son. And so Elijah prophesies she has a son. And we'll go on about that at another time. Okay? But she went from the part, from the place of revelation to impartation. Amen? Okay? When the chamber was prepared, I'll close with this. When the chamber was prepared, the word came to live with her. And once the word came to live with her, then the promises began to come. See, we want to walk, we always want to walk in the promises of God. But before we can walk in the promises of God, we need to be able to receive the words of God. We need to be able to receive the living, speaking, rhema. Word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our life. We thank you, Lord, that we make a, declare, a declaration now that we're going to make the word the centerpiece of our life. We're going to make the word prominent in our life. We're going to make the word first place in our life. We make a declaration now that we are going to be people of the Word. We're going to be livers of the Word. We are going to walk in His Word. And we thank you, Father, that you are going to watch over your Word to perform it in our lives on a daily basis. In Jesus' name we declare, amen and amen.